Okay, that was, uh, that was the plan. And now we've been told, we've been told that the weather would, to do it when the weather was good, the weather was forecast to be good on August the 6th. So we had our briefing August the 5th for takeoff on August the 6th and dropping the bomb. Now you all expect something very dramatic. You've been seeing too many moving pictures, that's all I can say. It was not dramatic, it was just plain hard work. You had to take, plan the mission and take, and what time you wanted to drop the bomb, work everything backwards, to what time you want to take off and everything of that type. The Japanese to this day say you drop the bomb at 8.15 uh, Hiroshima time in order to get the most people out in the open. Wrong. I dropped the bomb at 8.15 in the morning because we had to get back to the field before dark. We had no lights on our field. That's the reason why we dropped the bomb at 8.15 in the morning. <coughs> they took us in, they gave us all the briefing, you know what briefings are, that just, you're not, they're, they're supposed to avoid all the got shot, the, all the LACAC batteries and all that sort of stuff. The uh, main thing I recall about it is that when the briefing was all over and everything, they told us now, it's about 10 o'clock, go back and get some sleep, and we're going to call you about 10 o'clock tonight for a final briefing. How they expected to tell you that you're going out and drop the first atomic bomb and then go get some sleep is entirely beyond me. I know Tibbetts didn't sleep. I know Fairby didn't sleep. I know I didn't sleep. Why? Because we're all three in the same poker game. <laughs> I'll show you how bad it was. I don't even know who won that day. Then about 10 o'clock, they call us again for the final briefing, which was uh, primarily radio signals and everything of that type. And uh, then, then over for breakfast. I do remember what we had for breakfast that morning because Paul Tibbetts liked uh, pineapple fritters. I hate the damn things and uh, that, all that. But Rank has his privilege, so I ate pineapple fritters for breakfast that morning. And then we're down to the airplane. And we get down to the airplane was our first surprise. The airplane was all lit up by keg lights, like a... And there were a lot of radio interviewing going on, a lot of picture taking and everything of that type. And it looked like a Hollywood premiere. In fact, I said, it looks like a Hollywood premiere. Dick Nelson, uh, he was, comes from Southern California, Dick Dick Nelson did. And he said, looked at it and he says, ah, oh, looks like a supermarket opening to me. <laughs> and that sort of thing. Point I want to make is none of this picture taking, none of the interviewing or anything of that type was being done by the media. There was not a media person on the island of Tinian. They were the closest they got to us for, for two, three weeks over there was Guam, which was about 60 miles away. And even the best reporter in the world couldn't swim 60 miles. So they, they didn't bother us at all. It was all being done by the Manhattan Project just in case, in my opinion, just in case the bombs didn't work and they had a congressional investigation and Leslie Groves was going to be called upon to, find, to ask how he spent two billion dollars of money and had a bomb that didn't work. And everything, that, that was the only, th but the major reason why all that was being done. Well then we finally get in the airplane to take off and we're off the ground. Getting off the ground that day was our biggest problem. Because number one, we were grossly overloaded. We had to have the bomb in the frontal part of the plane and then the fuel in the back part of the plane, back bomb bay of the plane uh, just to get our weight balance even and everything of that type. Tibbetts held the airplane on the ground much longer than usual. I should have brought a videotape along. But Bob Lewis, the co-pilot, reached for the yoke of the plane to pull it off the ground when he reached the usual 140, 140 miles an hour that the B-29 took off at over there. When he did, Bob Paul Tibbetts looked at him and says, keep your damn hands off that yoke, I'm flying this airplane. And he did fly the airplane, and he got us off the ground and everything of that type. All I can do, remember, is I'm looking out the window, and I see water out there all of a sudden. I say, we were flying or I'm swimming awful fast, one of the two. <laughs> We climbed very slowly out of there and everything else, and we stayed at low altitude till we get up to Iwo Jima because 
Navy Captain Deke Parsons was on our plane, and he was a man most responsible for making our bomb, the U-235 bomb. He was the most responsible for doing that. And Deke says, I think I can arm the bomb in flight. And so we stayed at low altitude while he went back into the bomb bay, fiddled around with black powder down there, putting black powder in the back of that, in that cannon to fire the uranium projectile forward. Now the fact that we were flying that day, and I had that atomic bomb about three feet behind me, didn't bother me a whole lot. But Dick Parson being back in that bomb bay, fooling around with black powder, <laughs> that bothered me, and everything of that type, because I knew what black powder could do.